Hi everyone and welcome to Drinking Water 101, an introduction to River Network's Drinking Water Guide. My name is Shada S. Nasheri and I'm the Drinking Water Program Manager at River Network. This series will walk you through our Drinking Water Guide, a resource for advocates, highlighting the key pieces of information and questions to ask to understand your drinking water system from the source all the way to the tap. This session will focus on the question, what does my drinking water system do? In this session, we will define a water system and the most common types, walk through the different components of a typical water system, talk about different regulatory mechanisms that water systems must comply with, go through some case studies related to water system operations, and end with the key questions you should ask when getting to know more about your community's water system. Drinking water systems manage safe drinking water from its source to our taps. The primary responsibilities of a drinking water system are to maintain an adequate supply of water, assess water sources and identify potential threats, treat your water to potable standards, communicate essential information about drinking water safety to customers, and maintain the infrastructure needed to deliver potable water to your home. Water systems vary greatly in terms of how many customers they supply, how they're owned and operated, and the specific treatments needed to get your water to a clean and safe standard. It's important to understand the different categories of re regulated drinking water systems as regulatory requirements differ by system type. Regulatory requirements will be covered in more detail in the session, what frameworks are in place for making sure our water is safe to drink. The Drinking Water Guide primarily focuses on public water systems. A public water system is defined as a water system that provides water for human consumption through pipes or other constructed conveyances to at least 15 service connections or serves an average of at least 25 people for at least 60 days out of the year. Public systems may be owned by a public entity such as a city or a private entity such as a for-profit company so long as the water is being provided for the public. For the purposes of regulating drinking water, the US EPA defines three specific types of public water systems. Community water systems, which are a public water system that supplies water to the same population year round. About a third of all wa public water systems fall into the category of community water system. While some of these community water systems serve very large populations, such as in New York City, the majority of community water systems serve very small populations. Non-transient, non-community water systems. These are a public water system which regularly supply water to at least 25 of the same people for at least six months out of the year. This includes schools, factories, shopping malls, hospitals, etc., that have their own water systems. Transient non-community water system. These are a public water system that provide water at places such as gas stations, campgrounds, etc., and may be seasonal and or people do not stay for long periods of time at this service area. This chart provides an overview of community water systems in the United States, those water systems that supply water to the same population year round. There are just over 51,000 community water systems in the United States with the greatest percentage of those systems, roughly 55%, serving 500 or fewer customers. Small water systems serving small populations face exceptional challenges in delivering clean, safe, and affordable water to their customers due to a number of factors that limit the water system's capacity. This can include, Difficulty attracting and re retaining qualified operational and managerial staff, especially in smaller or more rural areas. Ensuring staff capacity. Water system staff may play multiple roles and may have other jobs outside of the water system. Staying adequately informed of and trained on evolving regulatory requirements, operational and managerial best practices, and technological advancements in the drinking water sector grappling with higher per capita cost of drinking water service to their customers compared to larger systems and with constraints on customers' ability to pay for water services. And finally, 
geographical distance from other communities and water systems and from state and other technical assistance providers. These challenges can translate into higher costs of service due to inefficiencies and workforce turnover. Costs can be passed on to customers in the form of higher water bills that may lead to issues of water affordability and sub subsequent loss of access. The issue of water affordability, including concerns of equity and justice, are covered in more detail in the session, what does drinking water cost and what is my water bill paying for? In addition to customer hardship, water systems themselves can face hardship from underpricing their services, leading to difficulty in maintaining the water system and paying for routine maintenance and infrastructure upgrades that are often associated with maintaining regulatory compliance for safe delivery of clean water to its customers. Management and oversight of drinking water systems can vary widely by state. About 80% of all drinking water systems in the United States are publicly owned and serve 88% of the US population. These water systems are often overseen by their board of directors if the system is separate from local government or overseen by a city council or equivalent if the water system is part of municipal government. The remaining roughly 20% of water systems in the US are privately owned. Privately owned water systems are regulated by public utilities commissions or public service commission and managed by a board of directors and executive staff. Public utilities commissions and service commissions regulate rates for customers. In some states, public water systems are also regulated by these same entities, such as in, in the state of Wisconsin. Now we'll walk through the typical components of a water system, following the water as it enters the facility, the treatment process, and delivery to the consumer. As discussed in the first session in this series, water systems generally get their water from surface water or groundwater aquifers. Whenever possible, water systems seek to use raw water of the highest quality and of sufficient quantity to increase efficiency and limit the need for additional water sources and treatments. Raw water is defined as water that has not been treated, including rainwater and water collected directly from lakes, rivers, wells, and springs. Raw water has not had any minerals, particles, bacteria, or parasites removed by water treatment processes. In this image here, you can see the flow of water from source to the water system to distribution. Water is taken from its source and is either pumped or flows by gravity to the treatment plant. Following the treatment process, clean drinking water is stored in an elevated tank. Distribution mains carry water from the treatment plant or tank to service lines, which connect to homes and other buildings plumbing systems, delivering your water at the tap. Water mains provide water directly to fire hydrants as well. As mentioned previously, water systems take in raw water, which can have different bacteria, minerals, parasites, and other harmful contaminants in it. Surface water sources are vulnerable to microbiological contaminants like bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Groundwater, on the other hand, is less susceptible to these issues because of the natural filtration system from soil and sediments above an aquifer though may be more vulnerable to other naturally occurring and man-made chemicals released during manufacturing and other activities. Contaminants found in groundwater also may accumulate more due to the lack of sunlight and airflow and the slow movement of water underground as compared to the more exposed and rapid flow of surface waters. Public water systems using surface water are subject to federal regulations known collectively as the suite of surface water treatment rules, among other regulations. These rules require systems to both filter and disinfect the water they use. In general, water systems install conventional water treatment methods to deal with the most common contaminants. This pro process includes a combination of mixing, flocculation, sedimentation, filtration, and disinfection. In rare cases where water systems draw surface water from source water that is heavily protected, the system may have filtration avoidance status, meaning they must only disinfect their water before dis distribution. Public water systems using groundwater are often required by state authorities to disinfect their water as public health safeguard and do not often require the same, retreat same treatment as those systems using surface water. 
Depending on water quality issues, water systems may add a range of additional treatment technologies, usually at higher costs, to meet drinking water standards. This is often done in response to specific contaminants of concern, poor water quality, and regulatory requirements. When a water system is unable to deliver drinking water that meets health-based standards or aesthetic requirements, the water system can install point of entry or point of use water treatment devices. This is done to address, address issues in the short term while the appropriate measures are taken to resolve the water quality issue or install the appropriate system-wide equipment, which can be a time-intensive endeavor. Point of entry treatment devices treat water entering a building before it's distributed to the taps in the building. They are attached to the building's pipe system. Point of use treatment devices are attached directly to faucets, spigots, and water fountains. These are only effective if installed correctly and can be an important resource for mitigating contamination of water as soon as it is detected and prior to system-wide fixes. One example of advanced technology being applied for a specific contaminant of concern is the, in the treatment of PFAS and PFOS, the non-stick chemical that has been shown to cause health issues and has been found in groundwater sources in recent years. These additional technologies are often associated with federal orders and often come with a hefty price tag, as in the case of the Peace Air Force Base in Portsmouth and Newington, New Hampshire. PFAS and PFOS are found in firefighting foams that were used at the base and were found to have contaminated local groundwater sources, subsequently impacting the community's drinking water source. In order to ensure uninterrupted water service to users, water systems often rely on different water storage systems. Water storage provides backup to a water system when unexpected events occur, such as a chemical spill or other contamination issue, wildfires, or other unanticipated treatment issues. Water can be stored with, pre, with both pre and post treatment water. Post-treatment water is often stored in water tanks, water towers, and reservoirs. The type and capacity of the water storage unit a water system uses will depend on the topography of the area, how the water system is laid out, and other considerations. In general, protected water storage unit units are preferred in both pre- and post-treatment situations. However, some systems do still rely on open-air reservoirs for their water storage. These types of storage systems are much more susceptible to contamination by animals, windblown dust, debris, and even algae blooms due to the direct sunlight they receive and excess nutrients they may contain. Many of these open air reservoir systems are being phased out and replaced with underground storage systems to avoid these problems and meet drinking water regulations. Post-treatment potable water is delivered to consumers via pipes with the assistance of valves and pumps. The distribution system also uses the water storage systems we just covered, as well as meters and fire hydrants. Most commonly, potable water travels through a series of underground water mains, which are large volume pipes, traveling from the water treatment plant to the service area. The service line, a narrower and smaller volume pipe, then connects to the water main on one end and a building's plumbing system on the other. Responsibility for different components of the distribution system can vary. In many municipalities, the water system is responsible for the service line from the private property line, water meter or curb stop to the water main, while the property owner is responsible for the service line from those locations into the building. In some instances, the municipality is responsible for the entirety of the service line. You can contact your water system to find out which part of the service line is covered by which party. This information is important when considering leaks or contamination issues, such as with lead service lines. There are many commonly used materials for drinking water supply piping, including galvanized steel or iron, copper and unplasticized PVC. Metal alloy, alloys such as alloys of copper mixed with zinc, lead, tin, and silver that exceed the performance specifications of each metal alone are also common. 
Identifying the best quality materials and technologies for plumbing are constantly evolving. It's important to note that lead was a commonly used material in, in homes built in the United States before 1986. We know that there is no safe level of lead consumption and due to many factors, we know that service lines containing lead may present contamination issues when corrosion occurs as pictured in the third image on this slide. Public water systems are required to comply with regulations developed by the US EPA under the authority of the Safe Drinking Water Act. This means that water systems have different requirements depending on the type and where they source their water related to safety and water quality meant to protect the consumer from harmful contaminants. Water systems monitor and report non-compliance findings, such as when they find too much of a specific contaminant in their water. You can use EPA's Enforcement and Compliance History Online system to learn more about your water system's history of monitoring and complying with relevant regulations. The EPA sets standards for more than 90 contaminants in drinking water through national primary drinking water regulations. These standards seek to protect human health by limiting the allowance of any one contaminant in potable water. This chart here shows current maximum contaminant levels or MCLs or treatment totals or TT, as well as the public health goal on the far right col column. In many cases, the public health goal is zero while treatment or contamination standards stand marginally above zero. In order to comply with these rules, the EPA also sets water sampling schedules and methods that water systems must follow. More of this will be covered in section three, what frameworks are in place for making sure our water is safe to drink. In some instances, a water system may be required to provide public notification if they are found in violation of one of several requirements related to the contamination of water. This can happen due to an, uh, to an unforeseen contamination or failures in the monitoring and testing procedures that ultimately determine the safety of a water system's flow. If you'd like to learn more about your water system in particu particular, you can look to your consumer confidence report. These are developed and disseminated twice annually and must contain information on your water source, a summary of risk of contamination of that source, regulated contaminants in your water and their health effects, any steps the system is taking to restore safe drinking water if there has been a violation, and other education information regarding specific highly toxic contaminants as well as contact information for your water system and the EPA. Two case studies in the guide focus on the water system failures in Flint, Michigan and the need for community action and advocacy to navigate the issue of lead contamination for the diverse residents of Flint. The high profile example of widespread lead contamination in Flint underscores the importance of water system management, from ensuring the appropriate funding and staff to oversee the water system, to having proper protocols in place to detect issues and alert the public immediately after they arise. Once the event unfolded, the need for multilingual resources and outreach was evident as not all residents were receiving the same information. Transparent communication by water system and identifying ways to communicate with all consumers via equitable community engagement strategies is essential to an informed public and preventing public health emergencies. Key questions to ask about your water system include questions about where your water system draw its water, draws its water from, who owns your water system and what oversight exists? What is the treatment process for your water and how is your water stored? It's also important to consider how your water is distributed, including the age and quality of your pipes, as well as ownership. For the full list of questions, you can look to the drinking water guide. Thank you for tuning in. We hope this was a helpful overview of our drinking water guide.